So welcome everyone to this webinar. I'm Rafael Carmona from the ICDR. And on behalf of ICDR Young and International, I want to just take a moment of your time before we actually begin to remind you that you can join as a YNI associate. If you go to our website, um, you can Google us ICDR Young and International, and you can find our website where you find registration forms in Spanish and English as well as the recordings of our previous webinars. You can also find us in LinkedIn. So we have a group also called ICDR Young and International and you can request to join. We'll also be posting all of our updates there. And finally, I want to take a moment to thank you all for attending this webinar and to the panelists and the co-moderators, Luis Martinez and uh, Michael Mara. And uh, with that, Michael, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafael. Appreciate that. And thank you everyone for attending the International and Domestic Construction Arbitration Lessons Learned from COVID's Impact. Uh, I am Michael Mara, Vice President of the AAA ICDR Construction Division, and I'm joined by my colleague Luis Martinez, VP of AA ICDR's International Division as co-moderator. Um, I'd also like to thank our uh, cooperating organizations, uh, the ABA Forum on Construction Law and the Society of Construction Law for your help in promoting this webinar. We would like to make this an interact as interactive as possible and I'd ask that you ask questions using the Zoom Q&A feature. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, of course, always feel free to uh, reach out to Luis and I directly. Um, I'd like to take just a, a minute to introduce our faculty. Um, let's start with uh, Albert Bates. Uh, Albie is a partner in the construction practice group of Troutman Pepper and leads the group's international construction projects practice. Among other recognitions, Mr. Bates is a fellow of the American College of Construction Lawyers and a fellow in the International Academy of Construction Lawyers. In addition to serving as counsel in arbitration matters, Albie is an experienced arbitrator and mediator for U.S. and international construction projects. He is a member of the AAA's construction mega project panel and the ICDR's international roster and has worked on disputes arising in the U.S., Canada, Latin America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Thank you for uh, joining us, Albie. Thank you. Um, Aisha Nadar is an active in, is active in large-scale cross-border infrastructure and defense programs. For over 30 years, she has handled all phases of their negotiation and implementation. She advises clients on strategic procurement planning, contract drafting, contract management, and dispute resolution. She acts as arbitrator, mediator, adjudicator, and dispute board member, and has experience as president, sole arbitrator, and as member of tribunals. She is listed on the panel of conciliators at ICSID, a panel of construction arbitrators, and the FIDIX presidents of dispute board adjudicators. Thank you, Aisha. And lastly, uh, Dr. Anna Maria Popseco is a managing director of BRG's international construction practice based in Denver, Colorado. She is a construction arbitrator with the AAA and a licensed professional engineer with more than 27 years of experience in project management, construction claims, schedule delay analysis, project controls, and contract management. She holds a PhD from the University of Texas in civil engineering. Her doctoral thesis focused on forensic schedule analysis. Dr. Popseco's project experience includes power generation, natural gas drilling, pipelines, petrochemical and process plants, oil and gas production platforms, mining, water treatment plants, airports, telecommunications and commercial construction in Australia, Canada, the US, Mexico, South America, South Africa, and China. She is also the chairman of the Society of Construction Law North American chapter. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you. All right, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Luis. Okay, great, thanks, Michael. And again, thank you to our co-organizers and thanks to all of you for participating. Uh, today, let's see one second, the slide advancing. Okay, sorry about that. It's uh, irony here that we're gonna be talking about technology. 
and I'm having a little problem with the PowerPoint, but I think we're back on track. And it's a broad discussion really on technology, looking at the lessons we've learned in the last 18 months, virtual hearings, but really all with the underlying perspectives of uh, the experiences of our speakers, focusing on the construction industry, international and domestic. Um, just to put it in some context, we are tracking, the uh, American Arbitration Association is tracking all of our instances of virtual hearings. We have a live tracker that you can actually visit on our virtual hearings uh, information box at adr.org, also on icdr.org. You can get an idea of some of the statistics there, tracking 15,845 events, the number of cases with virtual hearings. You can see there, uh, which I think really mirrors some of the discussion points that we had in preparing for this, uh, much more used in the full evidentiary hearing, uh, but also mediation sessions is a little bit hard to read, but preliminary hearings, settlement conferences, and you can see how statistically they have expanded really from the beginning when we transitioned to working remotely in March, 2020 in the pandemic and where we are now. So it's interesting to follow that progression. Um, just to give you an idea on the cases, we had almost 1,600 cases that have used it with 3,300 hearings. The uh, COVID resource page I mentioned, and that page uh, includes virtual hearing guidelines, protocols in place um, for how to set it up, how to approach it. I think a document that's very helpful too is the virtual uh, model orders and procedures that you can actually use to discuss this early on with the parties, a lot of the considerations uh, for setting it up. And I think a good number of those points will be covering as we go through the program. Uh, we're also seeing now too, an increase in hybrid hearings. In fact, I have two cases now where uh, multiple parties in, in different parts of the world, but the arbitrators decided to get together in our New York hearing facility so they could at least be in one room with social distancing. And uh, there were groupings of parties in other cities as well. So uh, they're looking at, uh, I think, that approach going forward. So let me start off now by teeing up our first discussion points. And today we thought it would be helpful really to hear from the different perspectives. Uh, we have a panel comprised of experts, arbitrators, uh, advocates, and uh, they have been going through this and, and they have mentioned some of their own experiences, not only in working with virtual hearings, but also related technologies and how they're being used in the virtual setting. So some of the points that we were gonna chat about today is really what they see that is working, perhaps some things that are uh, that they avoid. Um, you know, they, they all know the documents and the protocols and the model orders are uh, some things that they're applying, some things that they're not. So we're gonna go through broad discussions and try to get their perceptions. And let's just start off with the 30,000 foot view, uh, virtual hearings or in-person hearings should they all be uh, uh, virtual or how, how do you approach it? And I'll open it up to any of the panelists who'd like to start off with that. I can start briefly. And, and, and I think um, when COVID first struck, we, we were all kind of um, taken by surprise. <laughs> I think uh, February, 2020, March, 2020. Um, and some arbitrators decided uh, as, as well as the parties decided to defer the hearings and some decided to go with the remote hearing concept. I think today we would say as we, you know, while in COVID, while in the lockdown, um, remote hearings are, are very acceptable. Many institutions change their rules to allow the, uh, the remote hearings. But I think the, the, there is a, a compelling tension to want to go back to physical hearings by some uh, and, and maybe, you know, maybe counsel, uh, maybe some arbitrators, maybe some parties want to go back to physical hearings. So within the lockdown situation, I think remote hearings have been the norm um, in my practice, but as I see 
an easing of restrictions, I see more propensity for um, in-person or a hybrid solution to be customized for each individual arbitration. Okay. I agree with, I agree with Aisha's assessment. I think that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, one thing I would add in addition to that is, it's my belief that in the future, we're going to continue to see uh, virtual technology used as an important part of dispute resolution. That piece isn't going away. I think we will use it as an adjunct to in-person hearings rather than necessarily in place of adjunct hearings much of the time. Um, but it will be something that will be around, particularly for remote witnesses, for um, the right you know, individual cases and those kinds of things. I mean, I see in the, the PowerPoint, the, the word all, uh, and I always get a little hesitant when I see the word all in any question, because you know, at least in my view, each time we sit down and we think about a case, each one is individual. And we try to come up with what's the right way to try this case, what's the right way to present it. Is virtual right? Is you know, hybrid correct? Is it uh, in person? Um, and that involves a wide variety of factors in each of the cases. So you know, there's no one size fits all answer and, and hybrid, I mean, and uh, virtual technology will certainly be a piece of what we see going forward. Um, I, I agree. And uh, there is a problem that is maybe not as well understood until we start doing the virtual hearings for large international cases. It's the time zone issues. Um, there's a case, uh, it's about, it's gonna have about 50 experts on it. I'm testifying on in a few months. And even though we're going to do virtual, I, I told my attorneys, I said, look, I, I don't want to be getting up at one in the morning for the next four weeks um, and, and miss stuff. So I, I really, there is something there for international construction cases. The, the time zone issue in my mind is the biggest problem to a virtual hearing, unless the tribunal is going to be accommodating to the experts and allow them, you know, for them, who's going to wake up at one in the morning? Is it going to be the expert or is it going to be the tribunal or is it going to be counsel? And there is a disadvantage there if we're not all on the same page. Um, um, so that's something that I just want to uh, mention. The time zone issue can be a big problem. Yeah, it can. I think if the parties are principally um, American and European, it's much more uh, easy to, to conquer that challenge, whether you start at 7 a.m. in the U.S. Eastern Time or 8 a.m. in the U.S. Eastern Time and uh, stop a little earlier Eastern Time than you normally would, whether it's two or three in the afternoon. I've done that a, a number of times during the COVID uh, situation. It's worked well. When you get parties that are you know, 10, 12 hours apart, it's a much more difficult issue to get your hands around. It is much more challenging, and I, and I find that um, it, people are... It, less accommodating than they used to be a year ago. Um, whereas you kind of trade off jet lag for time zone, you know, so you get up at one o'clock in the morning, but you go to sleep in your own bed yeah. uh, or else you get on a plane and go to Australia. Uh, it, it's, mm -hmm. um, and I think people were, were more apt to, to view it that way um, initially, but today I think all of these factors are making the, um, <clears throat> the the solution or or, or the, the the equation uh these very interesting variables come in and and the nuances have to be considered for each case like um albie said and one of those key considerations like anna maria said is time zones um i, I would just say that one of the things that i've noticed is that i'm now seeing more in-house counsel actually attending the hearings uh, I don't recall seeing them as much when they were conducted in person. Uh, but they also, one of the things in speaking to them is that they're really partial to, for example, the hybrid approach, or at least having that option, because it gets to develop and train their upcoming in-house counsel and their own team. Um, just in your own experiences, are you seeing more in-house counsel participating uh, on the virtual hearings? The answer on, on my part is, is yes. And they kind of, they can, they're not there a hundred percent of the time. Uh, they do pop in and pop out and it's not only in-house counsel, but it's actually executives from the employers or, or the parties. And so I, I find that a real benefit 
uh, for possible settlement and arbitration because the, the actual party, not be it in-house counsel or the executives from the parties can, can get a, a, a better assessment as their case goes forward. Uh, yeah, we're also seeing um, in mediation, what we're seeing too is the, uh, is the insurers uh, being present where they weren't not generally showing up in, in in-person mediations. They seem to be joining a lot more often on the, on the mediations that are virtual. And I think that that too helps with getting it to settlement. I was going to say in most cases I see typically, I have seen historically one general, one in-house counsel would attend. Um, I think with the uh, virtual approach, we sometimes see two and maybe even sometimes three from one party attending for portions of the hearing. Um, so it, it has changed the dynamic because it makes it much more easier to attend. And Great. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. Um, I've seen the same. Um, and I think especially as an expert, it's good for in-house counsel if they've never, and I've had this experience, they've never read our reports, they've never seen anything, they've let outside counsel handle it all and the barrister, um, they get to hear us speak. And that gives them a good sense of comfort going, okay, we did the right thing. This is the right expert. They, um, when before they wouldn't even listen, they, in, if, the, if the hearing didn't go their way, they, they, there was just kind of a black, black box about what happened. But now with them being involved, they really understand the nuances and the questions of the arbitrator and uh, how we're viewed as experts in that light. Good points. And then the, the final hearing point really is just discussing what time frames and um, hearings you should establish for the preliminary conferences. Uh, do you approach the scheduling any differently? We did mention the issues of time frames and uh, I do find Zoom hearings literally exhausting. I, one concrete example is we just did an international arbitrator training that we did in two days, uh, half day virtually before it was one full day. I can tell you I was much more exhausted at the end of the virtual training than I ever did for the in-persons. Uh, I don't know if anybody shares my perspectives, but do you find it more tiring than uh, your hearings in person or any perceptions? I think one of the things I've tried to do when it's done virtually is take shorter breaks, but have them with more frequency. So you're taking you know, a 10 minute break instead of a 15 to 20 minute break. And people also tend to come back when you say, you know, we're gonna reconvene at 10.09 a.m. Uh, they're looking at that little clock on the bottom of their Zoom and they're back at 10.08 and in camera and ready to go. Where if you say we're convening at 10.10 and you're in person, if you start at 10.15, you're probably lucky some days. So I think that's one of the things I've changed. Um, I have been involved in some hearings with shorter hearing days, excuse me, shorter hearing days usually necessitated because of time zone issues. Um, so we take you know, a short 20 minute lunch instead of a normal lunch hour and a, a number of breaks. Um, but it, I, I share your view and I think a lot of people have had some degree of Zoom fatigue, especially if you've got a you know, two or three week consecutive hearing on Zoom, it becomes exhausting. Um, but so does, a, so does an in-person hearing, just in a slightly different sense. All right. I find personally, I'm more exhausted on Zoom. I mean, it, it takes, there's more intensity and there's a lot of, um, a lot of multi-processing that, that's firing and you're concentrating at looking at the screen. And I, I, I don't know if any of the, the other panelists share the same experience, but you're, you have to learn a whole new code of fa facial, facial features and, and body language, and 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 so you're you're looking at a, a Brady Bunch screen, and you're try as a as a or you're focused on a, an expert's testimony as an arbitrator, and you're just there's a there's a whole new code that you're trying to learn over the past year, um, and I I think that's been an exhausting process. Where whether lecturing. Um, like you're talking about, Lewis, or sitting and listening um, to testimony in, in a hearing as an arbitrator. So I, 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 I find that I, um, in, in my arbitrations, ha have shorter hearing days um, with more breaks like Alvia suggested. Okay. I, 
I think for an expert, it's a little different. I think honestly, Zoom is a lot less exhausting because if you're a good expert and you have a good report and you're solid and you're playing some, you know, schmoozy game with the arbitrator live, you're much more focused on Zoom. You're more comfortable. You're not intimidated. Like I had a hearing live the other day and the opposing counsel sitting next to me groaning every time I said something. And that was highly disruptive and it was annoying me. And I had the, the amount of concentration I had to do not to look at him was unbelievable. On Zoom, it's almost, it's very easy to kind of put that aside and focus just on what you're doing. So for an expert, I think uh, that emotional fatigue is much less on Zoom than in person. Interesting. One, one counterpoint I think I would share on that, and that's from the lay witnesses perspective. You know, I think it's a, it's a different issue. Flip the, flip the page completely, Anna Maria, because you've got a witness that's not comfortable testifying. Right. You've got a witness that if there's a written witness statement is going to come in and somebody's going to say, is this your written witness statement? Yes. Is everything here true? Yes. Cross examination. And they're sitting in front of a screen somewhere in front of a bunch of people that on a, showing up in a Brady Bunch screen that they don't know uh, answering questions. And I think it's very intimidating for that witness. And part of the you know, process of preparing a witness to testify um, is to make sure they understand how that's going to work, make them as comfortable as they possibly can, because. You know, if you're in person, you walk them in, you introduce them to each person that's in the room. They get a few minutes to sort of gather their thoughts and themselves and become comfortable. Maybe the day before you take them down to see the hearing room, and this is where the court reporter is going to sit. This is where arbitrator uh, so and so is going to sit, and arbitrator so and so, and arbitrator so and so. And this is where you'll sit. Then they just become a little more comfortable. So that ease is something that, you know, I think counsel, when they're planning their case, needs to really think about with lay witnesses, even very sophisticated ones. Um, because even if they're used to Zoom meetings and team meetings, and we're all sort of, you know, numb to those by this point, testifying is a little different, and they need to think about those kinds of considerations. Great. So on um, this following point, it's certainly something that uh, we are seeing. We mentioned it briefly, but uh, for example, in our international rules, the mediation processes now, they are opt out, meaning that mediation will in fact take place uh, unless the parties do in fact opt out. And what I'm hearing from our users, and we had some in-house counsel share perspectives, is that having the virtual option is certainly allowing them to participate in these mediations uh, with a bit more peace of mind, if you will, before they would have to travel, maybe find themselves in a city, sit down to a obligatory mediation, whether it was because of the step clause or whatever have you. And the other side comes in with really no intention really to mediate in good faith and uh, they don't reach a settlement here now because of these tools they can engage in these mediations uh, a bit more easily and obviously with less time and costs other aspects so for example you can participate with uh, under our expedited procedures where we generally don't require a hearing or if there's a hearing we suggest only one day but again made easier because of the options or uh, for example, emergency arbitration, those are really accelerated timeframes. Uh, you get that emergency arbitrator appointed quickly, you need the relief quickly. So having these tools, I think are all now available to try to explore and even resolve these cases quicker. I I'm wondering what the panel thinks, any perspectives that they have either from counsel or from the arbitrator's perspective? I, I find that having the technology as a tool um, makes the cost benefit uh, investment or uh, decision model uh, very viable uh, because I think pre-COVID, many of us had virtual uh, calls. We didn't have um, video along with this. And I think that's a game changer in having a virtual hearing that's not that has both uh, voice and picture. <laughs> so this this video conferencing um, capability, and ha having that ability of in-house counsel 
or the insurance uh, people, like Mike said, being present at a moment for a moment at a, at a particular uh, period during the day without having to carve out three days of their schedule to travel to a new city to um, not get on with the rest of their business and focus purely on this arbitration where they may not have the opposite uh, party wanting to negotiate in good faith. So I think that th there is much easier uh, decision making because the investment isn't so high. You can pop in for 10, 20 minutes, an hour um, in the morning, in the afternoon again. And I think um, you get a real good feeling of how your case is going and, and what's being presented. And then I think you can make that the business decision, should you settle, should you not settle, um, even during our, even as late as the arbitration hearing. So I think it's a very good tool. I mean, I agree. Yeah, I agree. The only, I, I would offer two points for people to kind of think about as they walk through this. One, it's it's great anytime you can make it easier for decision makers to be involved in the process. That's that's a bonus, right? Um, but there's two things to, to take into account, I think. First of all, if you're sitting there planning out the process, the process is somewhat different because now all of a sudden, instead of having everyone in this room and somebody else in this room, and you're walking back and forth between the two and easily judging the temperature in the room, easily judging exactly what's going on and where the pressure points are and who the right person is you should be directing most of your focus to and those kinds of things, it becomes much more of a challenge, particularly if each of the participants is in their own physical location. So sometimes council will bring everybody together and you'll have two rooms of people and you'll be in a separate location. But often it's you know 15 people in 15 Brady Bunch boxes, you break out into seven and seven or seven and eight Brady Bunch boxes. And it's much more difficult to get a read on the room. For that reason, one of the things I would emphasize for uh, counsel is to suggest a pre-mediation call with your mediator. So you sit down for an hour in advance of the call, get a good feel uh, of what things are going to look like, how the mediator is going to handle things, share with the mediator information that you want them to know in advance, and kind of jumpstart the mediation before you move to the virtual one. And I think you'll find the investment of that amount of time to do that is going to be well worth your while. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Anne. No, a question in the, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, one of the questions on the chat that I'm reading, did yeah. you see that, Michael? Yeah, that's it, what I was just going to say, yeah. It's very, uh, from Elizabeth, it's very apropos. I mean, go ahead, if you want to read it, go ahead, but I was going to, this as well as a dovetail that's, that makes it uh, problematic. Sure, I'll read it for everyone. What, what will you do if only one arbitrator has COVID concerns and refuses to have the hearing in person and everyone else wants in, it wanted in person, including the chair and the other wing arbitrator. Is there an obvious harm to have only one arbitrator remote? Should the whole hearing be remote? Well, I, I actually faced that situation. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was the chair. I faced that situation. Uh, and we determined that because of the uh, health risks that the one arbitrator had, that he would join virtually and the other two would join in person. Um, and then as it got closer to the hearing a few weeks later, everybody decided, no, let's just do it virtually. But that was a decision that we had made and we entered an order to that effect. Um, and then we modified the order and went to a fully virtual hearing. But consideration at that point was all of the parties wanted to go uh, live and in person. We had health concerns with respect to one of the participants. It wouldn't have mattered if it was an arbitrator or one of the parties or one of the council, we would have made the same accommodation but somebody had a legitimate health concern. And so we took that into account and crafted a solution that worked in that case. Anna Marie? Well, yeah, I had two extremes. One, there was a mediation. All the parties were there except the mediator and he was virtual. And I thought that was lackluster, that that was not helpful. Having him on the screen and all 20 of us are looking at him and it, it just, it, he needed to be there. I mean, if we're all gonna be virtual is one thing, but having the mediator virtual and everyone else in person was, it just looked lack a uh, lack of, and it wasn't even COVID concerns. It was because he had a scheduling issue in the last second. And and for me, it was a lack of dedication. Um, so that was a little disappointing. Um, and the other hearing we I was at, 
uh, the clients demanded, which I thought was a little unfair, both sides, all expert witnesses, all witnesses must be testify in person. And the arbitrator said, yes, we expect that. And I had some experts that were older. Um, they didn't feel comfortable coming to do that. And, you know, still 99% of them came, but a few didn't. And uh, supposedly it hurt our case. Now, personally, I think that's unfair in, in, in the light of COVID, because if they did get something and come back and something, God forbid, happened, um, that's a big liability. Um, so saying, was it less impactful that one of our experts didn't testify? Probably. But those are the kind of considerations people have to give and be honestly empathetic and thinking about that instead of demanding. Uh, I think that's unfair. Yeah, I've seen that handled um, when it's handled early on uh, at the appointment uh, or when you're deciding the criteria for appointing your expert or deciding the criteria for appointing your arbitrator. If you say that I, I demand <laughs> or I will demand in-person testimony, then you give the right of choice to accept an appointment. And I think if you want to have that sort of demand, um, then I think it, it, it should be part of the, the criteria of appointment. And I've seen arbitrators say, I will not travel during this time. And, and if that's accepted, then there's no, there's no issue going forward. So I, I just think all of these things need to be put on the table early Mm -hmm. and, and allow choice for, for people because um, traveling or exposure during COVID is really um, kind of a personal, uh, a very personal choice. And it's yeah. hard to mandate one and, thing or the other. And it's constantly changing. Let me yeah. uh, move on to the next point. So uh, from each of your perspectives, is there anything different that you do in preparing for hearings? Why don't we start with Anna Maria on that? For me, for me as an expert, no, uh, honestly, um, like I know everyone was saying, you know, they have to take three or four days out of their time to block off. As an expert, I have to block off two weeks before the hearing just to prep thoroughly. Um, in fact, I enjoy traveling because it locks me out of, I can just focus on this case. When, when you're virtual, you get pulled by demands of everybody. Oh, you're not there. So you can still help us with X, Y, and Z. Um, so in that sense, the preparation time though for the hearings is, is no different. It's just that mentally, I always go a week ahead of time. First of all, to get over my jet lag and B, to really feel comfortable, talk, go into the office with the attorneys, talk to counsel, um, sit around in the war room and work on things. Um, so I think the difference in preparation uh, is there's none except for the one week beforehand that I would travel versus sitting at home and doing it. And let me tell you, when I've been prepped by counsel on, on Zoom and in my, you know, it just been lackluster. Um, in person, they seem to put more effort into it, uh, which I was always a little bit surprised about. I have like seven hearings virtually this year and, and one live and much more thorough prep in my mind live when I would go there a week ahead of time. And that is what I was hoping to get on Zoom, but it seemed to like fizzle out. Um, so I'm not sure if that's just because people weren't aware of how to do it, uh, but the preparation time should be absolutely the, the same. Any other perspectives on that? Just two quick thoughts. First, uh... I think the same phenomenon you described with respect to the expert witnesses, Anna Maria, occurs with respect to other witnesses. You know, it's good to get people there. They're focused and they, you have a lot more of their attention. They get a lot more of your attention when you're both in the same physical location and not planning to meet by Zoom. So I think even though you try to do the preparation identically, whether it's by Zoom or, or in person, I think it tends to be different in real life. Second is, and I mentioned this just briefly earlier, but, you know, think of every witness essentially appearing in some sort of a television studio, but it's not really a television studio, it's their computer. Or, you know, you've got to go through those logistics. And if, you know, you show up on the morning of the hearing, you find out, you know, your witness is going to be using an iPad for his uh, testimony that day and, you know, treating it like it's a FaceTime call with his grandson, um, you know, you've got some issues. So you've got to go through all those logistical things and training items before you get to the hearing. 
What about uh, staff availability? I was thinking about the points of uh, as you're preparing in your council and your team, how do you approach the way of the virtual hearings of dividing up the labor and uh, who's gonna be doing what? And I'd love to hear some opinions on gearing up and getting your team ready uh, from the advocate's perspective. I can give you my perspective generally. The first point in the decision matrix is, are we all going to be together for the hearing? And if the answer is yes, then you move everybody to a central location a week or so in advance of the hearing, have it set up almost like it's going to be an in-person hearing. At least your team will be there and socially distanced and have plenty of space, but you're setting up your team the same way. It becomes, you know, if you decide, no, we're all going to do it from remote locations, including the witnesses, then it's a different planning strategy. And then you've got to really work with the integration of schedules and making sure that everybody is, um, you know, it takes a little more planning and making sure that you've got your prep sessions done on Zoom and those kinds of things. But I find that to be sort of the, you know, kind of biggest difference in terms of the way you prepare everyone. Staffing considerations, the only, only other thing I would mention, and I think we may get to this later, but is um, whether or not everybody agrees to have a, a Zoom master if it's going to go uh, virtually. So you've got somebody that's hosting the Zoom and somebody that's managing the documents, which relieves some of that work from the paralegal or your inside uh, person that would be doing it in any event. So, but planning all of those things becomes a, a little bit different challenge, but really it's making the decision on, on how you're going to present. Are you all going to be in the same room or not in the same room? If you are logistically, how do you do it? So that, you know, when, when Bates is speaking and Bates's picture comes up, uh, it's Bates and it's not somebody else that's in the same room because we've all got individual mics on our computers and you've got to figure out a way to solve that issue. And those kinds of things and making sure you've thought through all of that plenty of you know, time in advance of the hearing so that it all worked out. Interesting. All right, uh, we had a discussion about proving up damages uh, virtually, some of the issues to consider. And perhaps uh, Anna Maria, you can give us your perspective on that with what you've done. Yeah, I, I think damages or delay or any anything you're doing um, I mean, first of all, I always come back to the basics. Your expert report should have it laid out very clearly, the bottoms up approach, how you calculated, let's say your daily rate uh, or compared to your the other expert on the other side or anything. It should be very clearly placed in your report so that you can pull it up on the screen and walk the arbitrators through it very clearly. Um, something that we've done virtually to make it easier, which we've been allowed to do is like a PowerPoint presentation. Each expert give is allowed 15 minutes. And basically what we're doing is not, that's what you have to be very careful on that you're not introducing new evidence, but you're summarizing the key elements of your report and how you arrived to your numbers. Um, and in a PowerPoint virtual hearing, it's easier because you could kind of take the arbitrator step-by-step through each tab, but that's a matter of pre-planning. So like Albie was saying, you have to get approval from both sides that, hey, is that okay if my expert gives a, uh, a walk up, a build up? Because they're not gonna show a 20,000 row Excel spreadsheet. They're gonna show some kind of build up uh, spreadsheet, either multiple tabs or, and that needs to be agreed ahead of time uh, for this to be administrable. And the other side has the right to see it. I had several hearings virtually when the other side was proving up their damages, they were introducing new evidence. And I, you know, had a stop, send a chat note to my attorney, like literally on chat and saying, hey, this isn't, this is new. He's adding more stuff and I need a couple hours to review that. That's not fair. And I saw a lot of that insertion of new evidence, uh, especially for damage and delay claims in the virtual hearing. I don't know, that wouldn't happen as much in person. So that's what you just have to be careful of. Okay. So we did touch upon witness statements, virtual testimony and cross-examination. Um, Albie, do you wanna to touch a little bit more upon that in some of your perspectives? Uh, I just read a wonderful article that you did and you talked about witness testimony and in international arbitration and the risk of uh, cross-examination and considering your panel and perhaps you want to touch upon that in the virtual setting. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it was interesting. One of the things that came up in our discussion was we, we chatted a little bit about, you know, what is the role of an expert in arbitration? and uh, Do experts always follow that role? And I think in the international setting, there's a much greater degree of uh, importance placed upon independence than there may be in some of the domestic, domestic construction cases where some of the experts view themselves more as an advocate for their party's position as an independent expert providing information to allow the tribunal to make decisions on uh, difficult opinions and difficult issues that are being presented in the case that require expertise. Um, so my, my view you know, is fairly straightforward, which is that I'm looking for the information, almost like Anna Maria just said in terms of the way the claims are put together and the damages are supported. You know, I would like to hear an answer to the question that's being posed by counsel without, you know, sort of uh, a lot of discussion about where the counsel might be going or what the next question might be. But, you know, answer the question, work your way through without a lot of advocacy, be independent. Um, were there points that you need to address that are maybe weaknesses in your approach? Acknowledge that and tell the arbitrators, you know, why that's not an issue in this particular case. Because, you know, we are looking to you for expertise. And, you know, we're, we're able to figure out um, if you're trying to evade some point that you think is harmful to you and don't address it, that, that's not lost on the arbitrators. So you're much better, I think, to, to address it directly, um, you know, and, and get that in front of the panel. Um, anything else, Lewis, you want me to address or should I turn it over no, to others? No, that, that was fine. Um... Discussing yeah, about I, experts. Oh, did you want to say something, Aisha? No, I was just going to add that I, I think um, one of the 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 benefits that I found um, in in the remote hearing is um, the joint um, questioning of experts, the hot tubbing, so to speak. It's it's quite effective as an art from an arbitrator's perspective to have both faces directly. Um, and nothing between you as an arbitrator and the experts as you're posing questions to the experts jointly. And I, I find that is almost more effective in a remote sense, in a Zoom setting than in a, in a full physical um, hearing. So I, I think the, the, uh, going back to the first slide, it, it really depends and you have to kind of pick pick courses for courses and uh, the tool is out there and it's not, it, it can be used to um, a, a greater or lesser extent. So I think it, um, with, with expert testimony, I, I actually really like the remote hearing setting. Interesting. And Anna Marie, I, I wanted to ask you, you had uh, mentioned that virtual hearings for you are less stressful and uh, one of the things that you had mentioned when we were discussing it earlier was, uh, as we all know, a model order goes out and it has a protocol in place of how uh, the hearing should be conducted. And the arbitrators may at any time ask you to pan around and see, uh, make sure there's no coaching and uh, what documents do you have. Uh, and then you mentioned something that struck with me because I also have not seen it, that no one ever asked you uh, to pan around. No one ever asked what documents you're looking at. And I've seen this in all the cases I've done virtually too, that, that request is just not coming up. Um, what, do you, what do you think of that? Is it uh, something that you think is problematic, not implying that you would not be doing anything properly, but uh, does it have an impact? Well, I mean, not for me, because ethically, I know I won't you know, have notes in front of me or anything like that. Uh, however, I think there's a part of respect from the arbitrator panel. I think there's a little bit of sheepishness um, in the virtual hearings I did this year. Um, they believe everyone here is to be held at the highest level of ethics, um, regard, you know, counsel, experts. And I think for them to ask the question, it, it implies they mistrust you. And I think that's why there's reticence to request you to pan the room or hold up your, your report or page through it and see if there's any notes. I think there's a little bit of a, and I honestly think with the emotional drain that all of us has, have been through the past two years and the beat up we've had on our own for all this uh, working like, you know, 
just constantly through this pandemic and hoping that everything we come out okay on the other side. I think people have just been reticent to ask those questions. I, do I think it's a bad thing? I mean, I think if you have an expert that's going to have notes in front of them or inside counsel or outside counsel is going to be sitting in the back of the room questioning them, that will come out eventually because if they're unethical there, it's going to come out at other places too where those ethics occur. So I'm not concerned by it. Um, I think we all have to hold ourselves to that standard, but I think that's why it's not being requested of experts. And I just saw in the chat something that I think a lot of arbitrators have begun to use, which is kind of go through the ground rules at the outset of the hearing. Then as each witness comes in to testify as part of the oath that's being given, you know, you insert into the oath. And in addition, I'm going to tell the truth. I do not have any notes before me. I don't have any copies of the exhibits with any writing on them, blah, 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 blah. The things that are in your order so that they can quickly say yes. Um, and if they do, they have a chance to say, oh, wait a minute, I forgot, I still have this, let me get rid of it before I start to testify. But also, there's also the opportunity for counsel to request from the panel that they ask the uh, other side or the witness to pan around the room. I, I would just share that, uh, while I haven't seen that those types of requests, Along the lines of advocacy skills and, and what works and what doesn't, uh, in some cases, and it could be just my own experiences, but I would describe as what I'm seeing a bit of a pushing of the envelope of uh, going beyond what is really acceptable in hearings in person, uh, somewhat of an erosion of civility. We, we talked about um, the idea of theatrics and how effective they are virtually or in person. Uh, sometimes in the virtual settings, you're just not getting a feeling of how your advocacy skills are being perceived. I don't know if the panel wants to discuss that or if they've seen some of this or what, what is your take? I'm, I'm, I, I see some of that, but I'm not sure it's, it's not a, um, a societal question at large rather than remote hearings. I, I don't I don't I don't think it's just due to um, the the platform uh, in which the hearing is being held. I think it's 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 a larger question that people are testing limits and and finding new limits in 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 their human behavioral interaction. And I I, I think that um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that and I, 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 within the hearing, I think the role of the arbitrator, be it remote or be it a physical hearing, is to be in control of the hearing and to, to make sure that they navigate that ship safely through. I think you, I mean, at least my experience has been, you do see less formality, um, which sometimes tends to lead to uh, less professionalism and, you know, using the, the American view, sometimes you feel as though you're watching a deposition rather than somebody presenting to three arbitrators that are making the determination. And, you know, you have that issue from time to time in person hearings as well, but it's much easier to remind them. And I think you can uh, sometimes non-verbally communicate that, you know, stay in check here with what you're doing. Um, it becomes a little more difficult. And I think I've seen some of the advocates resort to a little more theatrics when they're on Zoom because they feel like they can. Uh, again, I don't find them to be particularly useful, as I said in my earlier answer, but I think that is something that you do see and people need to be mindful of and careful of uh, because it's you know typically not going to help your case as you're going through the theatrics. Good points. And I, I've also seen that uh, arbitrators in the cases I have mentioned, they've had to take a firmer hand uh, at times and really rein in and control uh, which is a challenge really in all cases, even in person. Listen, I'd like to move on to the idea of evidence and uh, managing the document bundles and evidence from everyone's perspective. What, what practice tips, what do you see that works and what are you doing? Any suggestions? And open up to anyone. I don't, I don't see that much has changed from from physical to remote. I, I think that having um, a, a set bundle for the hearing uh, pre-agreed uh, and, and made available uh, for easy access to the arbitrators and for presentation 
be the the hearing physical or remote remains the same and i i think uh, going back to albie's point of having a zoom master to control the to make it more elegant on zoom and and making sure that the retrieval of the right document um, and presentation of the right document and zooming in and making sure that you can walk you know capturing the arbitrator's attention and 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 really being able to have that document control is is quite important to effectively use um, the time, but I, but I don't see too much difference between physical and remote there. The one place where I see some some at least things that people should be aware of as they're presenting their case, uh, I think everybody will know, but arbitrators sometimes will pull up their own copies of the exhibits that are being referenced and be looking at their copies as well as the one that's on the screen, so that they can make notes and otherwise be able to track the hearings uh, to be able to read created and, and refresh the recollection as to what happened that day. Sometimes that becomes more difficult and challenging in the Zoom environment, particularly in, you know, Anna Maria pulls up a spreadsheet with 37 tabs that was produced to her as part of the hearing, and she's looking at tab number 20, cell C1742. And, you know, there's a, when you pop it up in Excel, it shows you how they got there. And, you know, we're all sitting here and looking at it on a computer screen. And at some point later, if we want to, you know, if that is an important number and an important chart, we're going to want to go back and look at it ourselves. And sometimes that becomes more difficult in the Zoom environment. So being aware of that, um, you know, summarizing it on the record so that somebody can easily go back and find it when they need to, just little, you know, simple points that you can think of, but somebody may want to go back and look at those exhibits, uh, make sure you've properly identified them so that they can do that. Um, and it becomes more difficult in Zoom than it does in real life. But otherwise, Aisha, I agree with, with what you said. Do you folks have an opinion whether you think, uh, I see many of the Zoom hearings we have are always recorded, but a good number of them still had the court reporter. Any impact on needing both? Do you think that uh, is something that's going to be changing? I, I have not seen a change in my in, in my hearings. I think there's there, there's they're recorded and they're transcribed, and um, the transcripts are agreed. And I I don't see any move for a change or any request or call for a change by by the parties or by arbitrators at this juncture. I, I have not experienced. I've seen some pushback on recording. You know, the caveat that it can be recorded for a limited period of time in order to allow the uh, stenographer to transcribe the record accurately. But then thereafter, other than the, the stenographer's recording, there's no recording of the hearings by Zoom that are available to the parties. Um, it's, again, something that I think you should discuss during creation of the virtual hearing order in terms of how that's going to handle. But there are certain individuals and certain companies that have real strong policies against uh, the recording of hearings via Zoom. So something to keep in mind and make sure you talk through with the other side. All right. And the arbitrators. Okay, so we're getting near the end. I just wanted to touch on a few of the main points. Um, so we talked about some of the time and cost benefits. What do we think about what we're gonna be looking ahead? Uh, I think we all agree that uh, virtual hearings are here to stay and related technologies. Uh, any other points that you'd like to forecast on? Or? I, I think that um, we see in many construction contracts, standard construction forms, uh, multi-tiered dispute resolution clauses that include either mediation or dispute boards. Or While I believe going forward, using uh, the remote hearings and technology uh, will be will uh, be a common feature um, more and, and commonplace in arbitration. I think in dispute boards and in my experience, as the COVID restrictions lifted, there was a real push by the parties to have in-person site visits. They no longer were able to accept um, a possibility of having a remote site visit. So I think it is going to be horses for courses. And while yes, you can use 
technology, having a site inspection via drone, you can have that um, capability. There is a the human instinct to meet in person, uh, particularly if you're trying to uh, avoid disputes or raise issues or uh, keep a project on su uh, a successful track. I think the human element is going to push back on and limit uh, the use of technology. And we will see more in-person activity in that space. I also, oh, go ahead, Anna Oh, sorry. I was just going to say uh, something that we all have to remember, especially on the large international cases that we're involved in, there are three to five years, two to, I mean, you know, millions, 50 million and up, 100 million, billions, for them, it's not a cost issue. They feel like they have one week or two weeks to get it right in front of the arbitrator. And clients, uh, like Aisha saying, really want to have that opportunity. And they feel that at that point, we're not going to save money for virtual hearings. We want to make an impression on the arbitrators. We want to be there. We, we've gone this far. You know, if it's a three, $4 million dispute, maybe not. But when you're in the 50s, 100 millions, and they've already spent millions on experts and attorneys, I think they really feel a lot of clients are going to say, no, we want to look the arbitrator in the eye. We want them to see our expert and, and our, you know, our body language in person. And I think they're going to demand it regardless, you know, because of the importance of their case. That, that is what I feel is going to come back. Um, not for everyone, it'll still be hybrid, but I think clients at that kind of level of cost feel that they, they need to have that in-person pleading. Right. I think there's, you know, it's in part a cost-benefit analysis. It's in part, are there any particular health risks posed to any of the particular participants that you might need to be aware of and accommodate? But I think we would all, I don't know, maybe we would all agree. I think, uh, I think we would, that it's not exactly the same uh, doing it virtually as it is doing it in person. That you know, there's a, a certain inherent benefits in doing the process in person, but doing it remotely is a very acceptable alternative, particularly you know when you have circumstances that dictate it. And you know, it's it's again another one of these items that I think you deal with very flexibly, depending upon the particular case that's in front of you and the circumstances and locations of people and time zone issues and many of the other things we talked about today. Okay, very good. Uh, just a, a question that just came up. What changes have you seen in learning and training side of things that have changed in the last two years for people new to arbitration? Is it more efficient now versus in person? When I can take a, an initial stab and Luis, please, please chime in. You just got off a, of a two day training. Um, but I think that is and I think this is what the question is asking in our training of arbitrators. Um, is it effective? And um, I think it's certainly more efficient. Um, people don't have to travel for, for training, uh, but I do believe in person is more effective. I think you get more of a sharing of experiences with people from different different backgrounds and their approach to arbitration that's that's a little bit lost on the on the virtual side. What do you think, Luis? You know, I, I agree with you. Um, been doing the training now for quite a number of years, and we certainly had um, more interaction, if you will. You know, if you're in a room with about 30 people, we have uh, a licensing dispute video that goes through and depicts a preliminary hearing. And then you stop and chat, and everybody's exchanging war stories and anecdotes uh, about how they handle that particular situation, how it happened to them. It, it's somewhat a, a more shall we say, a colder environment. It doesn't encourage that type of collegiality. So for training, I think in-person works. And plus, you get to meet one-on-one -on -one and have a better feeling of uh, if the points you are conveying are actually reaching out to the uh, people in, in the class. So uh, I think uh, international arbitration in general uh, evolving quite well. We were all very quick to adapt with the COVID uh, situation and working remotely and all that. But certain things that I miss when you're always in these, uh, as Albie calls the Brady boxes, uh, by the way, reference to a TV show famous here in the 60s. But uh, you they made a something. more recent movie, Lewis. So some of the people may have seen the movie that came out more recently. That's true. That's true. <laughs> 
<laughs> Luis was figuring he was going to date himself. I, I, I knew that there was a date. <laughs> I only see reruns. I've never saw. I, I can tell you, I I had no idea that there was a movie, but <laughs> but I know the Brady Bunch. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, listen. I, think I, I would just like to add, Luis, that um, you know, looking at the participants around the table, around our virtual table today, we have people from Qatar, from Ireland, from Scotland, from Romania, Canada, uh, even somebody from Stockholm, other than me. And I, I think that's what, what um, COVID has delivered to us, uh, having this accessibility and having this ability to exchange, um, it, it, you know, without, without the limit, and India also, I apologize, uh, <laughs> without, without, <laughs> without having that, the, the hurdle of the travel and the cost. So I, I think for new um, entrants to the market, it, yes, physical is important and, and, and that's, but you have access to so much more information um, and access to so much more interaction than, than pre-COVID, I think. That's a, that's a very good point, Aisha. It, the, the quantity of programming has certainly increased or the uh, ability to get to that program. And I, th I think you're 100% right there. All right, um, just quickly, one last point. I did want to, if I can move a slide, just uh, all the things you've heard today and, and so much of it can be incorporated as you decide what works best for you in the arbitration agreement that you'll negotiate with the other side. To that end, I would invite all our audience, if they're interested in going through a primer on the issues that you should consider when drafting your arbitration agreement, visit clausebuilder.org. It's an interactive tool where you can go through and see all the points that you should consider when drafting your domestic or international arbitration agreements. And with the interview, you respond to the questions and at the end, your responses will actually print out a clause that you have actually designed based on the responses given. And then you can consider how to customize it with a lot of the things we discussed here. So I'll leave you with that. And um, I do want to thank our panel. And uh, Mike, I don't know if you have any closing words. Yeah, just, just quickly. I think from, from my observation from the institutional side, I think that um, you know, the technology that existed um, has been advanced, I think, because of, of COVID. Um, people that would have never used Zoom or other uh, virtual platforms were forced to use Zoom. So I think it's in a sense here to stay and it's going to be uh, you know a cost benefit analysis for cases. I think we will see hybrid mediations and arbitrations. I think we in some cases the days of flying someone around the world for a couple of hours of testimony are probably gone. Um, and uh, so I think for us the, as the institution we you know we need to be ready and have been working hard over the past two years to make sure we are ready with the technology um, for hybrid in our hearing facilities, with the training on Zoom and the others. So yeah, I, I think this is something that's uh, here to say in, in one fashion or another. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Uh, really a, a virtual round of applause for our panelists. Great job. Thank you for sharing thank your you. perspectives. Thank you. And uh, the recording thank of this you. program will be available on the ICDR Young and International Library. I invite you to visit that library. There's over 40 programs on various topics all recorded and there's no charge to view them. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks everyone, goodbye. Thank, Thank you. Pleasure, bye-bye.